there's an obvious threat that's coming from the right that everyone in our world is constantly talking about. And there's another threat that's coming from the left that cloaks itself in language of justice and righteousness and morality. So Barry, why can't you and your journalistic peers just get along? Why is it so hard for you guys to be friends? I don't find it hard to be friends with most of them. I mean, I think that there's a a small sort of cabal or mi- minority group. Uh, cabal, I guess, makes it sound like a conspiracy, but it's not. It's just normal social behavior. Um, who, you know, really doesn't like when people that don't agree with their view of the world. And in fact, like every single detail of their view of the world kind of, you know, come into their playground. It pisses them off. And you you largely agree on probably most issues, right? Isn't that the weirdest part? Like, I mean, it's not like you're like some outsider who came out of nowhere and it doesn't make, of course you wouldn't get along. You got along for a really long time and you share very similar backgrounds and beliefs and lifestyles and all these things. Yes, we all like artisanal, bespoke <laughs> things, uh, furniture-wise, food-wise, and the rest. We we like a you know we like a restaurant with a good ambiance. Yeah, we're all like you know, middle class to upper middle class, you know, well educated, and so on and so forth. That's all true, but I think it's a mistake to suggest that this is about like policy and whether or not we agree on abortion or we agree on gay marriage or we agree on criminal justice reform or legalizing marijuana or all the things that would come to mind that, of course, I agree with those people on. I think what this is about, and I'm curious if you see it the same way, is about kind of like a like bedrock fundamental assumptions about the goodness or badness of liberalism is how I would describe it. Yeah, but I guess I, I think that's it. But but largely m- most of those issues that you agree with are downstream from a broad agreement on sort of Western values, I would feel. I don't know. I mean, ask the people that we're referring to in this sort of like weird, inchoate way. Do they believe that America is fundamentally a force for good? Do they believe fundamentally that America is, you know, (laughs) It is a country that has allowed for the thriving of, frankly, people like me and people like them in a way that few other countries in the world would allow for. I'm curious what they would say. I mean, to me, one of the things that was kind of like, I don't know what the right word here would be, tone deaf, not self-aware, shocking, is some of the arguments that I hadn't really heard since freshman year of college, which is to say these just kind of like, morally, culturally relative arguments that all cultures are equally good, that, you know, female genital mutilation is kind of just as good as not. I'm only being like slightly hyperbolic there. All of a sudden I was like, oh, these people actually seem to believe that, or at least they ape believing that. Yeah, it's it's weird, though. Maybe part of the problem is these sort of mansion questions like, is America a force for good in the world? Because it's complicated. Of course, America can be a force for good in the world and has also at other times been uh, a force that's not good in the world. If it, When America is doing what it should be, it is a force for good in the world. But that's not the discussion we're having. We end up sort of getting caught up in in what I might describe as sort of the narcissism of small difference. Like, like instead of coming, instead of talking about where we disagree on these little things, we end up sort of, uh, or yeah, like I, I would probably agree most people, I would probably think that most people agree that say uh, genital mutilation is bad, but we end up arguing with people who have nothing to do with that. We, we, you know what I mean? We end up arguing with our colleagues or coworkers on things that we uh, are in largely agreement with on most issues. Yeah, I mean, but, but here's, so there was an op-ed that was going around um, from the Times the other day about this woman who had built one of those like adorable little libraries 
Yeah. Did you see this, Abed? This is here. This is a sentence that was written in this piece in the New York Times by by a not just a random person, by a Times contributor. She she talks about how she built this library and she is trying to protect sort of black space. And she says, what I resented was not the specific couple. It was their whiteness and my feelings of helplessness at not knowing how to maintain the integrity of a black space that I had created. She also writes this um, of this couple. One morning, glancing out my window, I saw a young white couple stopped at the library. Instantly, I was flooded with emotions, astonishment, then resentment, then astonishment at my resentment. It all converged into a silent scream in my head. Get off my lawn. It didn't matter that I own my house as many of my neighbors do. Generations of racism, Jim Crow, disinvestment, and redlining have meant that we don't really control our own spaces. When you, that's not about the narcissism of small differences. Right. Anyone's entitled to think whatever crazy bigoted crap they want in their head. Fine. The idea that this is an institution that is elevating and giving real estate to bold, unadulterated racism that's dehumanizing a group because of their color. Like that's to me when it shifts beyond what I, like you, used to describe a few years ago as the narcissism of small differences. That's really interesting. Yeah, there was a Times piece I saw that, that struck me the other day, and I was actually talking to a Republican congressman I know about it. It was this piece about um, where the pro-choice movement went wrong. Uh, that, was the, that was the headline. And again, I think whatever, wherever you come down on the pro-choice or, or pro-life issue, I thought the, the article itself was illustrative. Because basically what happened is there was some conference call between a bunch of uh, uh, abortion activists uh, on the left um, talking about some uh, some laws that they passed in Texas, which I, I personally am opposed to. And um, <clears throat> some I, troll- I get to. <laughs> yeah, some troll gets on the Zoom call and he calls uh, the, the head of Planned Parenthood, who I believe is black, the N word, like several times. And so the, they're, they're kind of scrambling, just as you and I would be scrambling if some like, weird person started interrupting this call and saying uh, horrible things. And so at first she tries to like sort of uh, like push through it and then they end up having to cancel the call. Anyways, I, I, I would have thought this would have been a moment they all sort of rally around or being attacked, whatever. But if you read the piece, the fascinating part I was yeah. Planned Parenthood ends up apologizing for not protecting the safe space and not addressing the racist comments and, and that how this there, the, you know, does violence on the people on the call. I thought it was really illustrative because it sort of captured where certain movements are, which is they're attacked by an outside group, right? That wishes them ill. And instead of going like, hey, although we might have different experiences and different beliefs and different, uh, you know, uh, uh, worldviews, uh, on this call, we're all largely aligned on this issue. So then when we're attacked by an outsider, we'll uh, rally together, solve this problem, then we'll deal with our distinctions later. Instead, it, it spurs a bunch of infighting uh, within the group that, of course, doesn't make their actual objective of protecting abortion rights uh, any more possible. And I thought that was really illustrative because it was one, a microcosm of the infighting that I think the left deals with, but it also kind of, to me, was a microcosm of like America in the middle of this pandemic, which is this outside thing happens that's nobody's mm. fault. And then again, instead of rallying well, together- no, to be clear, it is somebody's fault. <laughs> yeah. yes. but, you know, what I mean, is, it's not like <laughs> yes. uh, uh, a person is doing it. It's a thing that's happened. Uh, as close to it's as close to aliens invading as we'll right. ever experience in our lifetime. Uh, and instead of being able to rally together, we then get caught up in these distinctions uh, that, that not only drive us apart, but also exacerbate the exact issue that we're supposedly the victim of. Are you making time for philosophy? Because if you're not, what are you making time for? Other stuff, less important stuff. To me, the question is like, who are you studying? philosophy with. The idea behind Daily Stoic Life is how can we, in this sort of series of communities, how can we create our own digital painted porch? This isn't the actual painted porch in my bookshop, so I love the symmetry of all that, but how can we make the community of Stoics, not just people who are vaguely interested in Stoicism, but people who are really committed to it, that's who this is for. If that sounds like you at all, check out Daily Stoic Life. You can go to dailystoiclife.com, links below, obviously. 
We'd love to have you. It's a free two-week trial. You get a bunch of cool stuff when you join Daily Stoke Life as well, including every year we do like a limited edition version of the best of Daily Stoke emails. You can only get as part of Daily Stoke Life. This is Mark's Relays coin, which I carry. It says, waste no more time arguing. What a good man is like. Be one. We'd love to have you. Give it a try. I'll see you soon. I have to look up the abortion story. I thought the one you were going to set up for was the op-ed that was just I don't know if you noticed the discussion over the past few days on Twitter. You're healthier than me and much more um, steeped in stoicism and hopefully will intervene in my life to make me as disciplined as you are. But in any case, if you were on Twitter over the weekend, there was this whole conversation stoked by an op-ed in the Times, of course, about uh, from someone who was adopted. And it was basically like I wish that like the trauma of adoption is so horrible that, you know, non-existence would have been a better alternative. And it led to this wild conversation where it's like, oh, now we're at a point in the discourse where we need to justify existence as being a fundamental good. It's just, it's a little mind bending. That That but, is, but, no, that is fascinating to me because I, I experienced it with, when I was writing the Gawker book, you realize that Ultimately, the sort of real victims of this way of thinking is primarily the people who like it's not fun to be those people like this sort of the cycle of New York Times op ed, Twitter outrage, yes. weird self flagellation that comes after and then sort of repeat ad nauseum. I, I thought like when you left the Times one, I was happy for you in the sense that it felt like you were cutting free of a not so fun place to be. Yeah, I ejected myself. I will say that cycle that you're talking about when you're inside the institution, that one or 20 others we could point to, it's so hard not to get caught up in the spin cycle. And, you know, I, there are times that I remember I'm like, I'm so embarrassed now where there was a there was a wedding weekend, a family wedding, and I was in Nashville. I'd never been to Nashville. I was excited to go to Nashville with barbecue, but 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 I could barely get out of bed. I was so flattened by one of these cycles, so depressed, so like humil humiliated, humiliated and embarrassed and and all of the worst things that we can feel. And looking back at it, I'm like, oh, that never happens to me now. Right. And it's amazing. <laughs> Yeah, it's like it's a sink. It's like a ship is sinking and you have to like kick out just far enough that it doesn't suck you down into it. There's like a, a toxicity and a self-loathing and a just fundamental unhealthiness that seems to define. I don't think it's just a, a left wing thing, but it seems to, this sort of uh, people who live their life primarily through the Internet outrage machine, uh, the political Internet outrage machine. It's just not a way to live, I don't think. Well, it, it's a choice, but I, I don't, to me, it felt, I'll just say that I'm not a person prone to being down or depressed, thank God. But when I think back over the kind of like, I don't know, the, the lows that I reached and the despondent feelings that I had, you know, I, I don't wish that on anyone. It's not... It's just so, it's just such a, such a time waste. It's such a waste of our time here, not to sound too cheesy about it. No, I think that's right. It's like, uh, sometimes I'll look at, when I do go on Twitter, I'll look at like the amount of tweets that a person has sent. And you're, it's just like, it is an interesting representation of how much time a specific person has spent shouting into a void of nothingness over things that, there's no way they remember tweet 11,013, you know? Yeah. I mean, if there's any sort of silver lining, Nellie and I were just talking this morning about, you know, whether or not, like how censorious Twitter is going to become under the new CEO. And I think it could be bad based on people that have already been kicked off in the past few days. Mike Solana had a great column about it for my newsletter. And I was like, well, maybe I would, you know, maybe I'll sort of, you know, find myself in in the maw of it. And maybe that will be a liberating thing for me, not to say that I'm cheering, you know, censoriousness on that platform or any other. But, you know, it's interesting to sort of like look at look 
at your life at a distance be like, wait, what would it be like if I just like wasn't allowed on Twitter? Well, I, I was thinking about that. Like the, the test I think of addictions is often like, if it was invented today, would you use it? Right. Like if they invented alcohol today, we'd have a very different relationship with it than like the fact that it's sort of always been with us. Like what would be different? Well, we would we would look so much more clearly at the negative side effects of it. We, we mm. wouldn't integrate it into our lives the way that it it sort of is. If if suddenly this new thing like you look at the reaction to, say, vaping and the somewhat negative effects it has on like young people, uh, we if, if alcohol was invented by a tech company today, I think we'd have a, a large debate about whether that something like that should exist or not. Same with, but same with social media, right? Like, yeah. why not just liberate yourself from it right now, though? Oh, because I, oh, I am addicted to it. <laughs> oh, a hundred percent. It's like a hit. It's like I'm like, I've never done serious drugs. I've never had much interest because I guess I'm lame and also just scared of what it will do to my brain. But in the meantime, I'm rotting my brain from within because of my addiction to this thing. Oh, 100 percent. I'm addicted. So now I'm sitting in front of someone who seems to have mastered his desires and addictions and um, proclivities. And I'm curious, like, what should I do? Well, I wouldn't say that I've mastered them at all. Uh, in fact, because I haven't mastered them, I have to have a lot of rules about like how I but use them. That's what I mean by mastered. Yeah. I mean, like you've set up guardrails for yourself that seem to make you an exceptionally productive person. Well, I don't even know the login to most of the social media accounts. Like I, I just don't I don't have access to them for a long time. I would just, for instance, like on Instagram, um, it I just had it on my wife's phone. So I had to be like, can I have your phone for a minute? Uh, which which kept me honest in, in more ways than one, I think. But the idea being that like, uh, since I didn't have it in my pocket at all times, I couldn't get the hit whenever I wanted, uh, which was helpful. And then I think it's ultimately, because it's not a real addiction in the way that like, you know, you would have to detox from heroin or something. It's mostly the habit formation. Like you sit down at your computer, what are the first tabs that you open? Or when you pull up your phone, what are the first things you click? And so I think a big part of it is just creating just enough artificial friction or uh, boundaries that it's not instinctually what you do. Um, and then you realize like, oh, my life is better and I get more done the less I use these things. Like I never go on Twitter, especially at night and feel like I'm so glad that I did that. <laughs> I'm always, I'm always well, more unhappy. Ryan, um, I'm a fan, but I don't know enough about your personal history to know, like, were you ever seriously enthralled to these platforms and needed to do that for yourself? To me, it's less the platforms and it's more just work in general in which like the platforms are a form of work. I think that's what's so insidious about mm. the the those platforms is that we tell ourselves it's part of our job. Right. So it's like I'm not just entertaining myself or arguing about politics like this is my job as a writer or a thinker or a even like as an informed citizen, I have to do it. So I think for me, it was just like the incessant checking. Um, but one of the benefits of having kids is you like you realize who you're stealing the time from in a way that you would never you would you like apparently I'll steal an unlimited amount of time from my wife. I'll steal an unlimited <laughs> amount of time for myself. But a five-year-old, I start to be like, oh, this is shitty. Like, this so, is mean. Okay, so this, So I was saying before we started recording that I read an essay of yours that I loved, and I sent it to a bunch of people. And there was also a poem in it that I sent to a bunch of other people, um, my, like, fancier friends, who I was like, they just need the original <laughs> poem that this is based on. And do you, know what, do you know what piece I'm referring to? Is this the work family scene? Scene, yes. yes. And... Well, I'll restate the argument to you to make sure I got it right, which is basically, it's so simple, but it was so like, aha, which was, you know, there are three things, work, family, scene, scene, you call it scene, but I'd call it friend, social life, frankly, like Twitter and like online friend life too. And you're like, you get to pick two. That's it. No way around it. And I was like, oh, really? And then as I was reading it, I'm like, yeah, you do get to pick two. And that's one of the shifts that I've sort of begun to feel in my own life. We don't have children yet, but want to, trying to. It's hard, I guess, when you're two women. Uh, <laughs> and 
you know, as I've sort of been throwing myself more into my work and building a company and the rest, I'm like, oh, wait, like I used to go out all the time. I used to be with my friends all the time. Like what happened to that part of my life? And I don't know, maybe that's just a natural shift that happens as we get older and the majority of us, you know, married, have kids, whatever. But I just love like so, I don't know, it was very refreshing to me. No, I, I love that. And I feel like if I was doing the piece over again, I would have made scene, social media more a part of the scene because I think it is. Um, like I remember, when, is. I remember when Clubhouse came out and people were like, oh, you got to join this thing. And I was like, I don't have time to to attend a virtual daily conference. <laughs> At, like, what are you talking about? This sounds horrible. Um, like, don't you? And I was like, don't some of you have children? Like, when are you going in these rooms and just listening to people talk for hours? But we, we because we can tell ourselves it's work. Um, that's one of the ways I think we lie to ourselves about the things that are actually just sort of about keeping up with with being cool or whatever it is at, at, at a pretty immense either personal or professional cost. When you were sort of, sh- you said in the piece that you were never really a scene person, although I did meet you at a sort of social event yeah. uh, the one time that I met you, uh, but you did also say then that you're sort of a curmudgeon and you're always doing your work with your kids. Like, did that shift, did, was there actually ever a shift for you or you, were you always sort of primarily work and relationship and now family? Well, I think one of the benefits of being an introvert is you're sort of naturally averse to seeing anyway. But like, I would just say yes to stuff because it seemed cool and it seemed like uh, irresponsible to say no. Like not irresponsible, but like, like it was almost like, um, uh, like, like pretentious to say no. Like I think when, when I lived in New York, mm. I, I I struggled with this the most because like stuff was always happening. Like there was always something better uh, that was worth doing at all times. Whereas like in Texas, I mean there is cool stuff happening, but like a lot of the cool stuff would involve me getting on a plane, so it's just like not really worth it. Um, so I think again having some sort of artificial boundaries that make it just re- increased the hurdle a little bit. It, it it filters it just enough that then I have the self control to do it. Like, but but the pandemic was a big shift for me in that like just a bunch of stuff that I used to do uh, unthinkingly became harder. And then once it was removed, I was like, oh, I don't miss that at all. But like what? But travel mostly, like like yeah. traveling, speaking, going meetings, or like hey you know, so-and-so is doing this really cool thing at this place at this time. And you're like, well, I can't miss out on that. But of course you can miss out on it. And if you didn't get invited, you wouldn't have missed it at all. But the thing that I struggle with that you don't seem to have as much of a problem with, and I wonder if it's an introversion thing, but I also wonder if it's a gender thing is it seems obnoxious to say no. Like, how do you say no to a amazing invitations, but also be like your friends who you love. Like, how do you, how do you slip yourself from the feeling of obligation and burden that I literally wake up at four in the, I wake up Ryan at four in the morning thinking about texts and emails I haven't replied to. That's my yeah. life. Okay. I, I just read this great book by Evan Thomas about uh, Sandra Day O'Connor, um, who I knew like next to nothing about. And they had this quote, I think I'm going to use it in the book that I'm writing right now. But one of her clerks was like, you know what I love about Sandra Day O'Connor? She's the only woman I've ever met who just says no. She never says sorry first. And I was like, oh, I love that. And so I, I do imagine there is some, I think there's an extra gender pressure uh, for sure, uh, sort of agreeableness or not wanting to offend people or, or you know, feel, feeling like, um, you know, if you already are getting fewer than your fair share of invitations, each one feels like more important. You know what I mean? Like if you feel yes. like you're you're being excluded a little bit, then when when the guys ask you to do something, it feels like it's extra. You got to do important. it. Yeah. Um, For me, but- it's more about agreeableness. It's more about, you know, uh, you know, if people and this might be, you know, my own neuroticism, paranoia, Jewishness. I don't know. It's like, you want to be agreeable because you want to be liked because you walk into a room and maybe you don't have the best Google search and, oh my God, people are like, oh, she's great. You know, which 
so it's like you want, like, I think there's an extra pressure to be, I, I'm inclined to want to be agreeable anyway. And I'm unlike you, you know, an extrovert. So I like live off of interaction from people, but I find it so hard. You know, you told me about that sign that you have next to your desk. I think oh, it's yeah, there. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I'm yeah. That right just now. says no. <laughs> and I think it was the, all, I think you took it from Oliver Sacks. Is that yeah. right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I remember that. And I, I came back after I met you and I was like, isn't, and I told Nelly, my wife, and I told people that are working with me, I'm like, isn't that amazing? <laughs> like, and they were like, well, you could do that. And in my mind, I'm like, I really can't right now. Does it help you when you think about the costs, right? Opportunity costs to me is the the swing vote in all these discussions. Do you think about what it costs you to say yes all the time? Yes. And I've gotten, I should say, I've gotten so much better than what I used to. But the feeling that cripples me is the feeling of disappointing people. Mm. So it used to be that I had much more bandwidth, let's say, to talk to a sophomore in college who was, you know, getting canceled for some bullshit reason and needed advice, right? Like I, I love connecting with people like that. And that was a huge part of my life. So those emails of help, like never stopped, but now I'm like, oh, I'm disappointing all of these people. Like I can't, I can't do like hand-to-hand combat in the same way. Cause I'm like, no, now I got to be strategy, grand strategy, but it's like the hand-to-hand combat is still necessary. So what do I do? Yeah. How do I not be like a horrible disappointment? Yeah. I mean, one of the ways I think about that is like, um, how do you, what are you willing to do? uh, And then what are you not willing to do? So like for me, like I just hate getting on the phone like that. I hate getting on the phone because then it has to be scheduled. And then once it's scheduled, then it sits in the calendar. Then I have anxiety about it. Then yes, I have- <laughs> yes. And you feel trapped. It's like yeah. if there's if I have a free day, which never happens. And then I see it like 4 p.m. There's a call. I'm like, yeah, this day sucks. Now like, my whole day is around that thing. Yes. Um, so so it's like, OK, I don't get on the phone. I don't schedule stuff. But like if you send me an email, I'll reply. And then it was like, I used to write these big replies and it's like, now I'll give you two sentences, right? So it's just like, I'm not going to give you nothing, but here's here's what I'm able to give. And then I think it comes down to some boundaries, you know, um, like, and, and then being willing to be the bad guy when you enforce those boundaries. Yeah. I think COVID was helpful for that too, especially with young kids. Cause I, I do have some of that agreeableness. So like, you know, like you're, you, you bump into someone and then you don't know where they've been or whatever. And they're like, Oh, uh, let me give you a hug. And you're like, no, uh, we're not going to do that. Uh, <laughs> like, but, but I, if it was me, if it was just me as like a single person, I'm pro- and I'm talking more like earlier in the pandemic, but the point yeah. was like you, again, because you had kid because I had kids, I had to be like, well, this isn't really about me. What what am what is my obligation to this other person? So externalizing a little bit was super helpful because then I could be like, like my wife was telling me, um, she was reading this thing about like what you're supposed to say, like when you drop your kids off, uh, like at a sleepover or or whatever, like all the things that you have to worry about as a parent, like are there guns in this person's house, like or are they a, a child molester or whatever, and that like as a parent you can't be like uncomfortable about talking about things because the stakes are very high. So you have to like go up to someone and be like, Hey, do you have guns in your house? Cause like, and like, yo, gonna... are you going to molest my kid? It's yeah. just like a natural banter with the kid. <laughs> well, no, she was like, as you're dropping the kid off, as your kid off, you go, Hey, by the way, if anyone touches you, you just like, give me a head. You know, like you have to talk. But the point is, I, of course. I'm, I'm totally butchering this, but the point is being like a shameless parent about it. Like yes. not giving a crap about what other people think because the stakes of the issue are really high. To me, I think the pandemic and then becoming a parent has been really helpful. It's like, yeah, uh, you're asking me to do this thing that if if we actually fleshed out what an imposition it would be, you wouldn't ask. So I'm going to have to like be clear about why I'm not doing this. And I'm just going to have to enforce the boundaries. So it, it's just made me better at just sort of being upfront and straightforward um, and then not giving a shit about what people think, which is ironic for you because that's something I wanted to talk about. You clearly are not afraid to be disliked. I mean, this is like but, your but whole this personality. Is, no, but that's what's so weird. You don't know me well enough to know that 
the idea that like I am somehow by nature a contrarian person or that I'm comfortable being just, dis- I mean, obviously I'm comfortable being disliked to some extent, although it's really overstated. Like my life is mostly really lucky and blessed and warm and surrounded by people that do happen to like me. But I like being liked. Like I, when I meet other people who maybe would fall into like a similar lane to me, professionally or, or like in terms of like public perception, I'm always like, oh, wow. Like we're so different. Like I really like getting along with people. I'm very uncomfortable. I mean, I think compared to most women, I would say I'm more confrontational, but like in the scheme of personality spectrum, not at all. Well, I, and I didn't mean to say you're like an aggressive person who picks fights. I just mean like no, if, no, no. If, if something is true, you will write it down. Like you, you're you, yes. you, you say what needs to be said in your writing. So it's it's ironic that then if like you have to say no and that's rude to someone, you're reluctant to do that, even though it's the same, the, the same choice. Sort of. I think the thing that allows me to be able to say it in my writing or in a talk or or out loud in public is that I am super clear about the things that really matter to me and that I anchor my life around. And frankly, that I'd be willing to like sacrifice for. And I'm super clear that being popular as, as wonderful as that seems is not as important to me as fighting for things that I really truly believe in. And that I think are at stake right now. And so that is like in, in that situation, I'm like, oh, I know what the right choice is. It's a little different when I'm like, wait, I could be getting on the 10th call this week with a college student that needs me, if that makes sense. It, it makes total sense. I think what that is, is an issue of identity. So your identity as a writer is a person who, that your identity, that it comes with certain obligations and duties and uh, a, a certain sort of authenticity and honesty but then often our identity as a person can be separate from that. So you can be like sort of a fearless warrior in what you do. And then someone can be more meek in their personal life. But I, what's ironic here is that they're related to each other. Because if, if you appear on every podcast that asks you or you say yes to every you know request for counseling or help, then you can't do the, the thing. thing that you do. And, and so when I, I go like, yeah, I have to do it because it's like being a parent is important to me. That's part of my identity or like being a writer is an important part of my identity. And this thing is stealing from that thing. So I'm okay being the bad guy to protect this other thing. I need to get into that mentality. I really do. Like I'm building a company with my wife. That's pretty weird. Oh, I didn't, I didn't know that you guys were working together on that. Yeah. This this is the, the media company. Yeah, like Nellie and I are working together now, which is great. We were just sitting the other day and being like, whoa, like, could we have imagined? Like, certainly not when we met five years ago, but a year ago, what our life would be. It's just, it's it, like things have changed in a radical way. In Do our you guys lives. work well together or is it very challenging? I think we work extremely well together. I, you'd have to ask her, but we, we had friends over the other night and they were like, how are you doing this? And we're like, oh, knock on wood. It's like actually going extremely well. And I think the reason for that is we have very different identities as writers. Like Nellie's a stylist. Nellie is like, she's an incredible, like she, for her, part of the pleasure in it and part of the reason she became a writer and a journalist is like, she wants to like go to the spice market and like taste everything and then bring it to you. And for me, it's like, no, I became a writer because I believe in a certain set of things sure. and I want to like push those in the world and try and shift the culture. And so she gets to be the like, you know, the like fancy precious cupcake and I can like be the cake stand and I'm totally happy with that. It, it's, I think the the other interesting shift for writers of which you're uh, uh, experimenting with and exploring is like the writer as their own boss and the sort of writer as entrepreneur. Like, I think the Substack stuff is very interesting because- um, Well, you kind of did it like before any of us. 
Yeah, my, my path has been a, a little bit different and a little bit that way, but it's it, it, it's interesting to watch some of these people talk and then people in journalism sort of talk about it from a very angry way. Um, like suddenly people are making all this money and it's like, no, your work was earning the same amount of money before. Just there were several middlemen between you and the customer who were keeping all that money. And that's why you were only making $80,000 a year as a salaried employee of insert institution. Mm. And now, now you're the you're the media company and uh, it's a pretty lean, efficient, and and maybe even profitable business. Yeah. The challenge I think is that it, it, it's, it unfairly rewards, and maybe it's, a, maybe fair is the wrong word, but if you are in this model, right, it doesn't work for the people that make like the meat of like the protein of a place like the New York Times or the Washington Post or the Journal, which is like, you know, most pe- obviously like we're writers, we notice bylines, but most people who read the Times and they're reading about like the way that Apple's caving to the CCP in China, they're not noticing like, oh, Jack Nickus wrote that, wrote that story. Yeah. They're just like, oh, that's 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 news that's important to me. And the person, it, it, this new mode, and who knows how long it will last for and when it will morph, rewards people that have already sort of created a brand for themselves as a name. And so I'm really curious to see, and I'm trying to do this somewhat in the writers and reporters that we're elevating inside like the common sense newsletter universe, are writers that don't yet have that brand and thinking like, oh, how do we elevate this person that's writing about this issue in a way that we think is really, really smart and deserves a wider audience. And isn't it, it's also tricky though, because as a writer who writes for an institution, your job is just to say whatever the story is supposed to be. But then when you have paying customers, this is something I have to think about with Daily Stoic, like I've had to set up certain boundaries again so I don't see what people think of what I'm saying. And I don't even see necessarily like, the financial impact of certain decisions. Like, I don't want to know how many people unsubscribed because of this thing that I wrote, because that will make it harder for me to say what I think is true okay, because so now I'll have this, this, this financial is all filter. I'm, but how do you guard against, like, so you're telling me you don't look at the numbers on a particular post or podcast or a story? Yeah, like I, I don't look at the day-to-day numbers and I don't look at the uh, the day-to-day responses. Like, um if people reply to a daily stoic email, I don't want to see it because I don't want them. I don't want to see them telling me that I'm awesome, but I really don't want them telling me that they unsubscribe because I said insert political thing that I think is important because then I'll be less likely to say that in the future because I'll be thinking about what it will cost me. You have to, I think, maintain some bubble yes. of purity. I completely agree with you, but I think you would, if you're, I mean, I'm not suggesting you're dishonest, but if you're really honest, you know in your heart and in your gut where your audience basically is Mm -hmm. and the things that would be sort of really out of bounds for them. And that would like the problem of audience capture that we can all see like so clearly in a case like Fox or CNN or the New York Times, it exists for all of us, no matter what, like no one has solved for that problem. I find I'll give you an example it did a like a symposium the other day on vaccine mandates. And I asked a range of people that I thought were really interesting, including Adrian Vermeule from the right at Harvard, who out of like a common good sort of Catholic worldview supported the mandates and also Glenn Greenwald. You know, we disagree on a million things, but I thought, you know, he is a very um, consistent civil libertarian, be interesting to get. I got any time I touched the issue of COVID vaccines, mandates from any perspective, like this is the thing that causes so many people to click unsubscribe. Yeah. And I've already felt like I'm like, but but this is really interesting. Like Austria is like locked down. What's going on in Australia? I want to go there. And I already feel myself having to like tamp down the risk aversion that I feel bubbling up because I, I, I'm running a business. It's I'm obligated to see what my subscribers like and don't like. Right. Well, it's, like it's, I, I just I guess what I'm saying is I think I think it's impossible to avoid it, even if yeah. you're not even if you're building the guardrails. And for someone like a Ben Shapiro 
or, uh, you know, Barstool Sports, New York Times, like their audiences are clear. I think for me, it hasn't even been yet a year that I've been doing this newsletter, a few months on the podcast. Like my audience is unclear to me still. And I don't fall, I think like you, Ryan, into like a clear lane politically. And I think that makes it a more difficult needle to thread because it's like, I know I have disillusioned liberals, but they're liberals. Yeah. And I know I have people in the center, right? And like, what does that mean? Well, and and by going one direction or the other, it could be, uh, you, you, can, you can get a sense of like how being clearly in one camp or another is a clear, safer financial yes. decision, and yes. to 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 sit to to maintain the ambiguity or the it's not even contradictions, but the independence to be able to pick and choose. The tricky thing is that is uh, both uh, financially risky, but it's also the sole reason that you exist. You know what I mean? If you were just yes. like everyone else, you wouldn't stand out. And so there is this tension between. You know, there's that line from um, Henry Ford, which I don't think he actually said, but like, uh, if I'd listened to my customers, I would have made a faster horse. That's what he said about the invention of the car. So it's like, you also have to understand that people don't really know what they want, right? They know well, that's what they like the Steve Jobs want. thing. Yeah. Yeah. They know what they Wasn't think that they the want. Steve Jobs thing? Like you got to show people what they want. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you have to realize that you could, by telling people what they want today, um, you could all, that might be the safe thing, but it also may well be the most dangerous thing as views shift over time. So you don't want to be someone who who was very of the moment in 2020 or 2021, but you're you're you don't realize that you're actually committing slow motion career suicide that's going to come back and get you down the road. Totally agree, and I think yeah, but it, it's it's an interesting so. The beauty of being at a place like the Journal or the Times, right, is that you're insulated from this information. And, you know, obviously different different companies had different models. I've read in your book about, you know, the Gawker leaderboard. And, and the truth is, like, you know, when a story of yours goes viral at the Times, yeah. even if you're not like in Parsley or whatever the data center was, it had a different name at the Journal. But the good editors would kind of insulate you from that and yeah. explain that, you know, a good publication means a mix of things. I'll give you, I mean, we, do, I am extremely interested in China as a subject, China and a lot of other <laughs> foreign places, foreign stories do extremely badly with my readers and listeners. They're just yeah. not as interested. If I did culture war stuff every single day and what's going on at this crazy prep school or crazy college, I'd be a very rich lady. But I feel for the sake of my soul and integrity and good journalism and and also like I think that the job of an editor is to in, like curate what they think is important and interesting for a reader. Like, yeah, I'm going to take a hit when I do those kinds of stories, but I'm not going to stop doing them. How do you manage that? I, I, I imagine it would be sensitive in your space where like the culture war stuff, let's say you write about this or that. Um, you're coming at it from a place of intellectual curiosity, let's say, or nuance or whatever, but you understand that it's also playing to a certain percentage of the population that's like, acting in bad faith or that you're utterly misaligned with on everything else. How do you, how do you think about, and, and I feel like some of the people in the sort of I uh, intellectual dark web have not navigated this well. How do you manage to say what you think, do what you think is important, but then not be used essentially as like a cat's paw for like bad people who want bad things? The easy answer for me is to say to you, I don't think about it. I just, you know, try and pursue the truth and try and, try and pursue. Of course I think about it. Of course yeah. I do. There's a reason that I, you know, I get invited on a lot of shows on a certain network, as you can imagine. And yeah. I haven't gone on them ever. Um, and of course I'm aware when I do a story of the way that it can be used. Well, that's one of the reasons that I think it's really important for me to both A, personally appear as a person in full with all of my contradictions and all of the views that I have on any number of topics that would make me detestable to the people that like my coverage of the culture war. 
Um, but also I think it's about what I was saying before, which is like the, like the right mix of, of stories. And I think like, I want to create an immersive world for people, like the kind of world I would want to go into and feel like, okay, yes, I had my broccoli and I had my steak. Oh my God, but that donut's amazing. Right now I'm struggling with the donut category. And the reason for it is that, you know, people came to me once I left the times because, for cult for culture war reasons. I mean, I think yeah. it's a limited way of explaining it, but let's just say that. But I know that if that's all people get, a it will give them a total misperception of the world. It may kind of radicalize them in a way that I think is irresponsible and also just inaccurate. And you know, it's it's a challenge though because just as an example, I assume that my reader is also reading mainstream media. And I assume that they're they're getting tons of coverage about January 6th and Trump and all of the rest. And so I'm like, can I really do that better than the New York Times can? Better than the Washington Bureau? Like, I don't think so. So in part, it's like, I think this will evolve over time. And the more that I can really create a full universe and not just like a stream that I'm very good at, then I think that I'll start to do some of those stories that right now I've sort of ceded to the mainstream, if that makes sense. It does. It does. Yeah. It, it feels, that feels like an obligation that one would have to have in your position that not all these sort of outsidery uh, intellectual figures are as cognizant about. And I, I see the damage that that does because I get the crazy emails from their fans sending me, you know, weird stuff. It, 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 I think you have to think about the context in which the things you're making are being used. Yeah, I agree with that. And for me, one of the challenges right now is that, you know, people are coming to me for a certain thing and they get an email from Barry Weiss at substack.com, but it's like, but I'm also interested in like satire and Shelton Murmurs type pieces. And there's just right now, there are so many kinds of things that have no home in the publications where they a decade ago would have. And I'm really interested in, in publishing a much broader range of things. Um, but I feel like I need to almost like acclimate my audience to getting used to that. And that for me begins with publishing people sort of in in like pu- publishing independent free thinking heterodox people on a range of different subjects and that i think i've been able to do extremely well and i'm not sure there's anyone else on substack that's quite doing that yeah the heterodox stuff is cool uh, one of the things peter Thiel told me and I, it's funny that you brought up that you don't see yourself as a contrarian he said like It can't just be like putting a minus sign in front of like whatever the status quo is or whatever conventional wisdom is. I love that. Yeah. What there, there, there seems to be, it's almost like politics of spite on both sides where they're like, oh, here's what so-and-so thinks, or here's what some people think. I'm going to think the opposite of that, even if the opposite of that is really stupid or obviously wrong. Yeah. What, what would be an example? Like, like. Not getting the vax or something. Yeah, I mean, vaccine is one, but but just this like uh, in reflexive sort of opposition to uh, on both sides to what what data might be or or something that makes you uncomfortable. Like uh, it, it's it's it doesn't seem like a fun way to live, and it also I think can drive you to some pretty dark intellectual corners. Also, yeah, I also just don't think it's like generative. Like it's yes. it's it's very easy to be anti woke and dunk on that all day long, um, and to some extent, I think it's important because I think that ideology has a tremendous amount of power. I really do. So I think it's important to expose it. But I also think there are other things: China and the rise of China being one, AI being another, and there's so many things happening right now. We're living in like a really transformational moment. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, I know how to do that kind of story, the culture war story so well, and I know how well that it does. Um, but I hope people that have been reading me and listening to me see that that's really not what I'm all about. And in fact, like on balance, it's just a a slice of what I'm trying to do. 
Well, and some things are just kind of, they, they're pretty straightforward and simple. So it's like the Trump one is a good example where it's like, oh, maybe actually he's playing this like four dimensional chess and he's like a G it's like, he could also, it's, he's probably just an asshole, dude. It's not, <laughs> like, it's not that complicated. So the, well, I, the, I've been in the signal group where people are like, do you think he's running? What do you think he's met? I'm like, he, he, he says everything that comes into his mind. Of, yeah. of course, of course he is. Yeah. You know, like, what are you talking about? Like, how are we still trying to imagine that this person is playing some kind of, yeah, four dimensional chess, as you put it? Yeah, you can end up overthinking yourself to a very stupid place. Yes, I agree with that. I agree with that. But it's hard because, yeah, Trump's a really good example. I've just, I wrote, obviously, pieces about him when I was at the Times, but I really haven't since the election, in part because I'm like, what is like one of the tests that my earliest editors at the Wall Street Journal would say to me is, OK, you're you're 20 years old. You know, we don't give a rat's ass like what you think about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. We're going to get the players involved in that conflict to write yeah. about it. So like the test that they always gave me and that I give to young writers is like, what are the things that what are the things that you are uniquely suited to write about? And I don't feel that I am uniquely suited to write about, you know, the threat of Trumpism when there's so many other people doing it. And I edited thousands of op-eds about it, but maybe that's mistaken. And maybe it's important, you know, maybe it's also important for me to weigh in on that more often. I don't know. I think it is a little bit. I mean, uh, if your silence on it could be misconstrued as somehow an endorsement of it, I think that's the tricky part. And that's the challenge, right? So, like, obviously, I've been watching the the case that was just heard. I'm blanking on the name at the Supreme Court that threatens to overturn Roe. Do you remember the name of the case? This is the Mississippi 15-week one, Ex- right? Yeah. Exactly. And, you know, one of my friends and an editor was like, we really should have a podcast or a piece about it. And I'm like, well, we just had this amazing podcast with Caitlin Flanagan about this topic. And it's like, but, but no, I'm worried that people are going to, like, hear your silence as meaning something. Yeah. This to me can drive me nuts where it's like, if I'm not weighing in on every single thing that's going on in every single moment, like people read into the silence and it's like, no, sometimes it's just like, <laughs> I don't have the bandwidth to do another thing. And it's hard, right. It's hard for me to sort of like know when the silence really matters and when it's important to, to speak up and say something. Well, I, I don't know to- how to, I, I want to talk about that because it, it ties in uh, as we wrap up. It ties into your to your book, How to Fight Anti-Semitism. Because I remember it in this would have been in December of 2020. I was talking to a, a politician I know, um, and I was like, "Hey, uh, you should really congratulate Biden on winning the election." And he goes, "Why should I have to do that? I didn't congratulate Trump when he run. I, it's not a thing that I should do." And I said, "Well, I think you know why you should do it. It's because." By not doing it, you're leaving it in limbo. And under normal circumstances, yeah, the, you don't have to congratulate a, a politician for winning an election. But when someone is actively attempting to undermine the validity of that action, then saying something conspicuously uh, matters and makes a difference, right? So I think, uh, and this is the the famous poem about about uh, the Holocaust, you know. Uh, First, they came for so-and-so, then they came for so-and-so, and and then finally, you know, they came for me and and no one was left. How do we know what issues to speak up about, right? How do we know when uh, it's something that, yeah, our our silence is, you know, uh, as they say, violence, or when we're just (laughs) chiming in for, you know, our own ego? Like, how do you know what to speak up about and not speak up about? That's a really good question. I... I think part of it is just like a intuition sounds like way too home birthy, but intuition. Yeah. Um, and and conscience, maybe. Yeah. What do you mean when you say that? Well, I, intuition it, it might imply that it's somehow like uh, you know, like witchy. No, no, it's just not not. There's not the moral component Thought. to intuition. Yes. Yeah. No. That. Yeah. That's. Yeah. It's. It's. Yeah, conscious. I can never say that word. That's why I'm not repeating it. Conscience. Conscience. I never, I can't say it. It's just, I can't. Um, Yeah, I think that's part of it. I also think there are certain things that we each come to be known for. And it's like, that's, oh, people are going to expect me to write about that thing. Um, But 
for me in this moment, it's like, there's a lot of nonsense that yeah. we could weigh in about every single day. Um, and then there are things that to me feel like they are threatening like the bedrock assumptions that make our freedoms possible. And, you know, I think that there's an obvious threat that's coming from the right that everyone in our world is constantly talking about. And there's another threat that's coming from the left that cloaks itself in language of justice and righteousness and morality. And I think that that one is sometimes harder to see. And that's one of the reasons that I have felt drawn to exposing it is I think I'm not, I'm no great stylist like Nelly or Hugh, but I think I am really good at is articulating for people in plain language, like giving them the vocabulary to articulate something that they have a sense like this is not right. And I don't really know why this isn't right. And I think I'm very good at, at saying, let me explain to you why I think this isn't right. Right. Yeah, it's like in the last 18 months. So first you have uh, George Floyd and then Ahmaud Arbery and everyone's sort of like, okay, we should all say something. Then there's this sort of rise against uh, or rise in violence against, you know, Asian Americans. And then people are like, should we say something? Should we not say something? Then there's this sort of rise in anti-Semitic violence. And then people are like, should we say something? Should we not say something? And it's, so it's, it's interesting. It's like, what is our obligation, right? Like when, when, like, you know, when, when is one obligated to speak up and say, that's not right. We don't do that. That's not who we are. And then when is someone supposed to go, oh, that's not my issue. I think your arguments about anti-Semitism have been interesting to me because there does seem to be a specific and uh, alarming sort of historical uh, relationality to anti-Semitic violence, where it's, it's sort of like a, it's the canary in the coal mine. Yeah, <laughs> because and, and this is me stealing a line from someone you should have on your podcast, who's the amazing, amazing Dara Horn. She has a new book out. Oh, you should. Hopefully this is in your bookstore. It's called People Love Dead Jews. Just won oh, some big awards. Jesus and Christ. Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a title you will not forget. She's a she's a Yiddish scholar. She's a novelist. She's an essay. I love her essays. And she has written so beautifully in this book and elsewhere about how. And I really think this is true, like where liberty thrives, Jews, th like where Jews thrive, it's a sign that liberty thrives. Right. And the reason for that is like our ability in a majority Christian country, you know, to think differently, worship differently, have really weird rituals. Um, like that's a sign that everyone has the ability to have sort of the dignity of difference. And when we are under siege, it is a sign that pluralism itself, um, liberalism itself, most broadly understood, is also under siege. Uh, going back to what you were saying before, though, I think we're living in a strange world where, like, corporations feel the need to speak out about, like, every single microaggression. Mm -hmm. And it's like, if you don't speak out, it's violence. So we're, we're in, like, this weird, extreme version of that. But I think one thing that I have noticed, and maybe you have too, is that you know, it's not a good sign when your care and outrage for a victim of a horrible crime or a rash of crimes is dependent on the identity of the victimizer. Sure. And that's sort of where I think we are, is like the reason that it's really hard for people to let's, let's say, you know, there's been an unbelievable rash of violence against Haredi, black hat, ultra-Orthodox Jews on the streets of Brooklyn, mostly carried out, or at least in some part carried out by young men of color. That's a hard one, right? Because it's like, wait, that group like doesn't believe in all the things I believe in and they're fundamentalist in all these ways. And so they are victimizing me, at least theoretically, or my identity group. And here's a group that, you know, historically has been the victim of systemic racism in the country. So it's like, I guess what I'm trying to push back against and what I'm trying to resist is to me, what is fundamentally dehumanizing about the worst version of identity politics, which is seeing all of us as like avatars for our race or our, any kind of like immutable characteristics rather than human beings capable of making choices. 
And I think that people don't realize the extent to which that dehumanizing version of identity politics has taken over everything. Yeah. And like what about ism is, is obviously a dangerous thing, but it is it is weird to, let's say, the in, immense focus and attention that gets played to, say, like trans issues. Meanwhile, uh, sort of anti-Semitism is something that we don't want to talk about. Right. Like even though statistically those groups are, you know, of similar numbers globally, like one gets a lot of attention and then the other is something that we seem not to want to make a big issue of, even though, as you said, historically, uh, one seems to be representative of uh, a trend, an alarming trend that you want to nip in the bud. Yeah, I actually have no idea how many like estimations of trans people there are worldwide. I think it's like Like 1%. Really? Yeah. Okay, I didn't know that. Um, Yeah, I... I think we can care about both things, of course. But, but but I think that like the silence around, I'll just say that like in, I, I've thought a lot about this issue and the kind of outrage that poured out rightly after the attack on the synagogue in Pittsburgh, where I became a bat mitzvah, white supremacist, neo-Nazi walked in, killed 11 Jews, most lethal attack in American Jewish history. And it was like, oh, this is morally clear. Like, Innocent people, look, not Orthodox Jews, concern, you know, look like us, sure. attacked by a vicious neo-Nazi. We know, you know, and then when, you know, black Hebrew Israelites, which, you know, they are not neither Hebrew nor Israelites, you know, uh, try and blow up, but end up killing four people, a kosher supermarket in Jersey City. It's like, no one remembers that. Why? Yeah. Is it, is it, uh, is this, uh, is this us filtering it through the media? Is it just, uh, you know, just the, the, the random, I don't want to say luck, but just the random way a certain story unfolds? Or no, I think it- it's intentional. I think, why is it that, you know, Daryl Brooks allegedly I should add in Wakusha, Wisconsin gets in an SUV He has a long history of horrible, hateful ideas all over social media, many of which have now since disappeared. He is a kind of avatar, um, a different identity online. And he gets in an SUV and drives through a Christmas parade and murders six people, including an eight-year-old boy and dancing grannies and injures a ton of others. This was a news story for a day. Come on. Like, it's sort of impossible not to, and in meantime, I mean, listen, yeah, I think that there's like so much horrible violence in America, you know, like not all of them are going to capture the national imagination. I'm personally obsessed with Ghislaine Maxwell. You may be obsessed with Jesse Smollett, you know, fair enough. But I do think that there is a clear pattern and it has to do with, you know, seeing people either, you know, as somehow like less capable of evil and violence because of their identity. And I think that that's wrong. Well, and this is what I meant when we're sort of talking about what are our obligations. One of my favorite passages in, in meditations, Marx really says, and you know, you can commit injustice by doing nothing also. So it's like one of the one of the first sort of indications we have that quote of like all that evil needs to prevail is for good people to do nothing. But like when there is so much happening in the world and you as an individual seem so powerless. How does one know when they should speak up? When they, you know, how much of one's platform are they obligated to use to speak out about these issues? When, as you said, there's also a financial component. It's, I think these are just issues we're struggling to navigate as a society. And we're sort of sitting in this. Yeah. And then we're just all kind of staring out at this horrible world that we feel powerless to do anything about. Well, I think one of the tests for me is, are people not speaking up about this because they feel they're going to take a hit reputationally or socially. And if so, I'm going to speak up about it. Like for me is like, it's, it's not always, but I think that that is an important test is, you know, are people not speaking up about this because they're scared of the cost to them? I'm not really scared of the cost to me. I'm, I'm like post that, <laughs> whatever you want to say, like post, I don't think I'd be canceled, but it's like, you know, if people aren't speaking up against, let's say, getting rid of algebra in San Francisco, which is horrible because they're scared of being called a racist 
like, yeah, I'm going to speak up about that because I know that it's not racist to advocate for Math. children having algebra. Correct. So, and I think that there's like an inordinate number of those things things right now. But I think the thing to guard against, and and I, I, I'm always thinking about this in myself, is like, you know, there are also things that are getting a tremendous amount of attention that deserve a tremendous amount of attention. And maybe I'm putting too much weight on speaking up about the things that others are overlooking when I should also be lending my voice to things that are generally outrageous and are being noticed for being outrageous. I don't know. It's a hard, it's a really hard dance, actually. No, like this is the critique of Fox News that it's sort of like fake controversy after fake controversy. Their argument is probably like, well, no one else is talking about it. And then the the retort to that is, but does it actually matter in any way? Yeah. How do you know whether this issue is a minor issue that you're making into a major stir or um, if it's actually a major issue that everyone else is just afraid to touch? Mm hmm. Yeah, I think one of the ways to know that is to see what is the effect of it if you do speak, like, right, the criticism of me and people like me who try and shine a light on the liberal left is like, oh, it's just a bunch of college kids, stop. But it's like, well, hold on, what will happen if you criticize this? Might you lose your job? You know, like, I don't know, like, it's just, it's so obvious to me that this is such a huge ph- overlooked phenomenon. The reason people aren't talking about it is because of the reputational and career and familial costs. Um, but yeah, I think it's, I think it's, a, I think it's a really important question to be asking. All right. Let, I, I was curious about the intellectual dark web stuff because um, where people get their information is really interesting. And now that algorithms sort of, uh, sort things for us and surface things for us. Now that you're, we're several year, several years from the publication of that piece, how do you how do you see uh, that world? And how do you see, like, yeah, a generation of of young people getting informed by new ideas? Is it, is it is it still kind of inspiring to you? Or now are there parts of it that alarm you? Both, both. I mean, a hundred percent. Like, I think the thing sort of existed for the briefest of moments and then it sort of unraveled just like so many other things and the question of like why did it never cohere and was it ever possible for it to cohere I think is a really interesting one um I think that what that piece captured and I didn't really fully understand this at the time like I I noticed something I named it or I, you know, amplified the name, but I think what it did capture was the fact that there were all of these people that were not known, like their names weren't known to readers of the New York Times. And oh my God, they arguably, obviously, especially Rogan and Peterson, have an impact on the country exponentially more than all of primetime on CNN. Sure. And That to me is both amazing in the sense that, oh, wow, like you really can build new things and you really can sort of like make an end run around these institutions, but also, oh, wow, you know, gatekeepers are important. (laughs) And, you know, like, like, like there is a, there is definitely when I'm sort of watching some of these figures, I'm thinking, I'm not sure they've sort of updated their software to understand they're not the underdog anymore. Yeah. Like they actually have a tremendous amount of impact. And is there a sense of obligation and responsibility that's coming with that? And, and there's a and range of people right. in that piece. And I think that they have a range of different um, understandings of their role in the world. Yeah. And that, uh, you know, for all the criticisms of, of the sort of mainstream institutions without a certain set of principles or rules that you operate by, like standards that you hold yourself to, you can spin off the planet very quickly as well, right? So if you really yeah. are just, I take whatever the mainstream view is and I find a, a, an opposition view, you end up in, in fantasy land like really quickly. I agree. As, as we see with some of those figures. Yeah, and I think, I don't know, one thing I, I'm thinking a lot about for myself and what I'm trying to build and also just in general right now is like, we're in a very anti-institutional moment, I think. And 
you know, we're living in a weird, almost like tent revival, but online where people like follow around their little online preacher. Yeah. And the question is like, can you build an institution with the kind of rules and guardrails and mores that I think we both agree are important for sharing a sense of reality and truth with other citizens in a moment where people are just so skeptical of institutions, rightly. Right. And I, to me, that's like the whole challenge because one thing that's become just incredibly clear to me is, especially as institutions have revealed themselves to be so degraded and compromised, is yeah, that's true. But also we need to live in a world with institutions that we can all trust. Like that's extraordinarily important. And the right, question the is, how, the do you, how do you make that? The problem is not the existence of the institutions. The problem is the decayed institutions that are no longer true to their founding values. And that's right. if you, a world without institutions is chaos, or as, Doc, as Peterson would say, uh, is, is, is chaos and disorder. Right. Yes. And you, you need order and values. The problem is uh, what happens when you abandon those things. And there's a second part to it also, which is without the framework of an institution, how do you mentor new people? How do you how do you like replace yourself? And this is something that I am fixated on, because if the whole show is you and your brand and your personality and your special charisma, like what happens when you burn out? Sure. What happens when you cash out or or any of it? Like, so like, what was all the work for? And I am like very, because I think about my own life and the extent to which like everything was made sort of possible because of mentors and people that nurtured me and institutions that formed me and spent so many thankless hours teaching me how to edit an op-ed. Like, I want to, I want to be able to do that. I'm, I, and, and part of it's, I don't know, maybe also personality. Like I am, and I don't know if this is a gender thing or not, but I'm really not interested in being like a one woman band. I'm really interested in like creating an orchestra. And, and one of the things that I think is a shame a little bit about that world and I think it's just, be, I think it's beyond the intellectual dark web. It's like the wild west of the new media landscape is like, okay, yeah, it's amazing that you have this many listeners to your podcast or whatever, but like, what's going to live beyond you? And I would love to see some of those figures thinking about that question. No, that's great. I think that's an awesome spot to stop. Uh, I always love talking to you and this was amazing.